I said, are you a communist? And he went, oh, yeah. And I said, great. Well, then it's great that we met. Communists really are everywhere. I never would have thought that a canvasser walking up to us would be the type of person that we could potentially recruit. You could never guess from looking at this man that he would be even like interested in a conversation with somebody donning, you know, communist colors and communist ideas. But then it was a friendly conversation. That was what surprised me the most. People are just like waiting. They're just waiting to get involved in something revolutionary. Revolutionary ideas are about to take the American political landscape by storm. We are back. After a couple of months of silence, Socialist Revolution podcast has been wrapped up, and this is actually a brand new podcast, Communists of America. About a month ago, we launched a new political party, a revolutionary party in the U.S., and so I am very proud to announce that this podcast is the voice of the revolutionary communists of America. This is the sound of the Communist March that we organized in downtown Brooklyn, New York on February 25th, right after the launch meeting where we announced the new party of the Revolutionary Communists of America, the RCA. That meeting and that rally had a big impact in the country and internationally as well, which I think confirms all of our perspectives that there is a huge need to build a genuine revolutionary party in this country. We received over a thousand requests to join the party, and I think we've tapped into something very powerful, into the force that's going to allow us to overthrow capitalism in this country. So Comrade Bryce introduced the launch meeting on February 25th. We called this meeting because the current political situation constitutes a political emergency, and we've turned it into a Northeastern communist rally here in New York. We also have people watching this meeting across the country. So we had hundreds and hundreds of communists gathered in dozens of cities around the country uh, from L.A. to Seattle to Dallas to Chicago to Atlanta to Boston, really uh, all over the place. We even have a comrade from New York who's currently working on a cruise ship and he is also tuning into this meeting. So this really is a coast-to-coast -coast meeting of communists across the country. So with that, to introduce the rally, I'm going to bring on Antonio Balmer from the Executive Committee here in New York. And Antonio is here with us today. So what is the Revolutionary Communists of America? When we talk about the Revolutionary Communists of America, first and foremost, we're talking about a generation, millions of people that have gone through an experience of sharp capitalist decline that have been raised in that kind of uh, environment who hate capitalism and they've come to communist ideas. It's a huge segment of the population. But RCA is also the party that's going to organize that generation to take action. It's also the organized wing of that population that is trying to gather everyone else together and build a party that can actually carry out a revolution and overthrow capitalism in our lifetime. And we're going to talk more about why we're launching this party in this particular moment. But just to go back quickly to the impact of the meeting, which, as I said, we announced the launch of the party and immediately we get a massive response is a confirmation of what Antonio just said, which is that there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people there's out there. Definitely millions. It's definitely millions <laughs> of people out there who who identify with communism and who see it favorably and they want to know all right what's next i mean what do we do about it but yeah like you said i mean we got 200 million views across the platforms on twitter on x and on it was actually picked up by some state media in other countries yeah we got hundreds of millions of views um we actually were the second most popular video on baidu which is uh the the top search uh engine in china um so we really made an impact um and also of course the right wing picked it up 
And they shared it, again, for their own purposes to scaremonger and, oh, wow, the communists are a danger to American values and blah, blah, blah. Um, in fact, look at this TV called, um, I don't know what they are, but America TV Miami. So some kind of gusano uh, Cuban thing who played the video and were worried. They were saying, comunistas salen a las calles de Nueva York con banderas de la hoz y el martillo. So communists uh, pour into the streets of New York uh, with uh, hammer and sickle flags. Son de hoy en Brooklyn, New York. Los comunistas salieron a las calles, salieron del closet de forma multitudinaria. Eh, escuchamos ahí lo que gritan, ¿ven? Dicen que la única solución es la revolución. So they're actually, they were saying just now, they are hitting the streets unmasked in view of everyone coming out of the closet in a massive way. And I think that's actually the impact of the video. I think that's the reason it went viral is because if you look at the video, I mean, it is quite striking to see a sea of red flags on the streets of the largest American city. And, you know, it's like, we are here. We're not hiding. We're communists. This is our, <laughs> we're openly declaring our intention. I mean, that's the spirit of the RCA. That's what we're here to do. Um, we're not hiding our intentions. That's right. Uh, and uh, right-wingers like Jordan Peterson retweeted it, which only helped us. Again, all these uh, right-wing trolls start piling on and it helps, it feeds the algorithm. Uh, and it really helped to get like a bump of submissions of people asking to join, donating to us and so forth. And these right-wingers, I mean, some of them like Jordan Peterson, they're, they're a joke. They, you know, they're, they're just like, uh, you know, clowns. Um, but some of them, they see that we're serious. They see that we're a different kind of party, that we're not like the old quote-unquote left uh, and even even though they don't agree with us, they can't help but respect us uh, to a certain point. Here's this uh, right-wing anarcho-capitalist uh, blogger, Carlin B. Beyond, there is a lot that I respect about what you guys do, and I'm not joking about that. I mean, listen, like mm. you guys are going to win because you are doing what's required to win. I, I have to give respect for the amount of hustle that you guys have. There's And it, it's gone on for so long, and you don't give a fuck, and you just keep going. You know, you have to respect that, even if you don't agree on some level. Thank you for that. And again, this just helps f feed the the enthusiasm and, and the basically like word of mouth starts starts happening and people are talking about us. And we have a comrade. He works in construction and he's working on a job site in downtown Manhattan. Uh, I'm a member of local 638 steam fitters of the building trades. Uh, so I was on the job and uh, we were working on a cooling tower. And I heard my coworkers, uh, he mentions that I saw on the internet that there was this communist rally that happened in Brooklyn over the weekend. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Little did they know their shop steward was actually at that communist rally. But, you know, it sparked a conversation and I, I started talking to him about it and, and brought up Marxism. And he was uh, interested in philosophy. So we started talking about Marxist philosophy and uh, it led to a very interesting conversation. But now he has on his reading list uh, some of the, the philosophical classics. Uh, so I've been talking to him, you know, back and forth about that. And uh, hopefully he gets to reading that. So that's great. Like workers are talking about the Communist March in Brooklyn at their job site. And, you know, the building trades in New York, that's the kind of workplace environment where if hypothetically a comrade were to put up a communist sticker, it might hypothetically get scribbled over uh, with the words, fuck Biden. And, and so we want to make it clear that we're not some kind of front for the Democrats, certainly. We're not here to tail end the Democratic Party. We actually hate Genocide Joe even more than the conservatives might. And so I think it's really funny then that that uh, news clip that we played earlier of the Cuban Miami Gusano TV it ended by saying the Republicans, what does it say? It says Trump is saying that we need to get a grip on these communists. Mm -hmm. And the Democrats say that the Republicans are exaggerating. Because, of course, these right-wingers, they say that the Democrats are the communists. But in this TV show, you had the, the pundit, the Democratic pundit that was talking, basically saying like, no, look, the communists, we expelled them from the unions. 
Uh, we, you know, scapegoated them. We, so don't worry. Like, so he had to like defend the honor of the Democratic Cap Party capitalists. So I think it part of the reason why this had a big impact. It is something that the United States of America hasn't seen in generations. And this is a new thing. This is not a political party like others. We're not here to support the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. We're not building a party that's going to tinker around with capitalism, trying to lobby politicians and try to pass laws. We're here to bring the whole system down, to get rid of these capitalist politicians, of these corrupt parties. And this comes at a time when all of 2% of the U.S. population has a great deal of confidence in Congress uh, as of September 2023. So it's tapping into that mood of discontent in a way that no other party can do or has done in generations. Yeah. Um, it's a shift. It's a shift from one period of politics to another. I mean, we, we, in 2016, you had the Sanders moment. And then you had the rise of this like very vague type of lefty democratic socialism. And that's kind of played out. I mean, it really has exhausted itself because you had a wave of self-described socialists in Congress and they did nothing, nothing to move the socialist movement or let alone any kind of a real class struggle force in the political landscape. They didn't advance it at all. I mean, they ended up voting with Biden on everything, including the making the railroad strike illegal, something that would have brought the class struggle front and center. Well, sometimes they vote against, like when the vote doesn't count. <laughs> I course. think Sanders voted again in the Senate, but they didn't need that vote, right? So You've had symbolic acts of resistance and like the meekest rhetoric that you can imagine. But in reality, I mean, AOC and these others, they said, we're going to go in there and we're going to fight for you. And it's just been a total flop. It's been very disappointing. And that's part of why a whole generation's like, all right, well, we tried that. We're ready for the next step. And that's what the RCA is offering. We're saying, yeah, we don't trust any politician in Congress either. And neither should you. The working class has no representatives in any of those halls of power. And people don't actually need to be told this. They already understand. They don't trust any of the institutions, the Supreme Court, the media, everything. It's just, it's all a, a sick joke, you know, in the eyes of millions of people. So, all we're doing is saying out loud, kind of, we're giving words to a sentiment that's already extremely widespread. That's right. And we make it very clear where we stand. You made it very clear at uh, our party launch meeting. We all arrived in the ranks of this international because we aspire to be participants in the overthrow of capitalism in our lifetime, comrades. <laughs> That is what we're here to do. And as Marxists, we understand that this system can't be reformed. It cannot be tweaked. It cannot be made nicer, more human. We recognize that this system has outlived itself. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to the, our viral moment, if you will, I did want to play this clip from, apparently there's all kinds of Chinese outlets, like I mentioned, that, that republished the video. Um, so let me play that real quick. Now, I don't... Uh, speak Chinese, I think Antonio understands it a little bit. <laughs> my, yeah, my Mandarin is not very good. But I do, yeah, I could pick up a little. He was saying, America, revolution, communism. Hearing these words together, he was expressing his surprise that, yeah, the launch of the RCA. But, I mean, I would tell this person, hey, don't be surprised. <laughs> it's actually been a long time coming, so... And I think it's clear that, you know, you have like the Chinese state or the Russian state, you know, they see this and they're like, America's being undermined from within. Look at these communists, you know, and of course we are, I mean, we should make very clear, we're part of the Revolutionary Communist International. We are for a revolution in every country on the face of this planet. We are going to overthrow capitalism everywhere, including in China, in Russia, you know, I mean, that's, they, the, these state media sources should be aware that uh, we are not like their allies on the ground. We are the allies of the workers of the world. But that being said, I mean, the, the real impact was there was this outpouring of support and solidarity from workers and young people who 
you know, this communist generation is worldwide. That's why, anyway, that's why we're launching the Revolutionary Communists International, not just here in the U.S. Yeah, and we're launching new communist parties and communist organizations in every corner of the world. We have sections and comrades in dozens and dozens of countries from Pakistan to Brazil to Sweden to Switzerland, Mexico, you name it. I want to move on to talking about why we're launching the party. I mean, we've talked about this a little bit already, uh, but what is it about the world that has created this generation and why are we launching it now? Well, this generation emerged from an entire process that you could say it's it's been 50 years coming, actually. I mean, the end of the post-war boom was uh, a pretty abrupt change in capitalism's uh, health as a system. The decline really took a sharp downward turn since the early 70s. And by every social measure since, I mean, we've compiled a bunch of graphs showing the metrics. And it's when visually, when you're looking at 50 years of capitalist decline, it becomes very apparent. The, the share of the economy going to American workers' wages has been in a free fall for 50 years. The rate of household savings has been falling for 50 years. Uh, household debt has been increasing. And basically, we've arrived at a working class that is largely living hand to mouth how many years it takes to buy a house. I mean, that's been going up and up and up since the 1970s. And the rise in military spending, the fact that that's gone way up since the 1970s. Increase in civil wars and the duration of those wars worldwide. The refugee crisis. I mean, especially now, not just because of wars, but also because of climate change. Just millions and millions of people desperately seeking to survive. The incarceration rate has gone way up. There's uh, drug overdoses have skyrocketed since the 1970s. All deaths of despair, which includes drug overdoses, but also alcoholism, suicide. I mean, people are dying young because it's so unbearable to live under this system. What does that tell you about the health of, you know, the social fabric of modern capitalism that people are dying because of how hard they're attempting to check out of this reality and they're trying to escape it. And I mean, there, there are unprecedented levels of misery. Mass shootings have risen sharply since the 1970s. That's exactly. If you look at the chart of the frequency of mass shooting events, it completely follows the line of all of the other uh, indexes of barbarism since the 70s. Mass shooting is a very complex thing too, but it's clearly a symptom of a society that's you know, at an impasse. And when you're raised in a, you know, in, in, they said the, the Soviet Union has collapsed. This is the end of history. Capitalism won. And now we're going to have a period of peace and prosperity. And the American dream, you know, this is, and then the reality that entire generation is faced with. And we're talking about the largest generation ever. I mean, millennials and Gen Z put together the, the youth basically those who are entering the workforce, that's the majority of the workforce. And their whole experience was, you know, coming out of high school around the time of the 2008 crisis, trying to get a job, uh, trying to go to college and taking on massive, massive debt. And then, you know, come graduating with all that debt, not being able to find, you know, a decent uh, job, not being able to get into the housing market rents skyrocketing. I mean, it's one thing after another. That's just the basics of capitalism, but, you know, a capitalist system in decline. But then on top of that, there's other things that are happening that really make it apparent to millions that this system is at a historic dead end. I mean, the latest is this genocide happening in Gaza. When you see that happening, I mean, it's the kind of event that pushes you to your feet. You can't just watch it you know, scrolling through a screen and ignore it and just feel okay about it. I mean, you're you're watching this happen in real time and people realize this is the U.S. government funding this. This is American imperialism. And what can I do to end this is another thing that's pushing people in the direction of a revolution. There you have also the climate crisis, this catastrophe that's coming that the fossil fuel industry and corporate America knew about they willingly subjected humanity to this risk because it was profitable for them. That was a, a risk they were willing to take. And we are all, as a species now, going to pay the price. This is another thing that helps people realize 
What do I, why should I defend capitalism? What has it done for the vast majority of our class or our human race? It's actually only benefiting a tiny, tiny handful of capitalists. And people are realizing, well, actually, that is the enemy. The country is more angry now than ever. I mean, you have this movie coming out this uh, this month of civil war because people can picture more easily like a, an actual all out violent conflict breaking out in the US. And that's, you know, it doesn't seem so far fetched to a lot of people. I watched the trailer. I don't have high hopes for the quality of the movie, but it's telling, <laughs> it's telling that, yeah. you know, this is the kind of film <laughs> that's coming out in this, in this moment. Uh, and I think the stats show that seven in 10 Americans say they are angry about the direction of the country. Nine in 10 are dissatisfied about the way that things are going. I mean, we're talking about 90% of the population <laughs> in what used to be the most stable bulwark of worldwide reaction, U.S. imperialism, that now has become extremely unstable. And going back to the question of Palestine, I mean, suffice it to say that on the same day where we were announcing this historic turn that we were launching the party of the RCA, Aaron Bushnell was lighting himself on fire to protest the ongoing genocide funded by U.S. imperialism. I am an active duty member of the United States Air Force, and I will no longer be complicit in genocide. I'm about to engage in an extreme act of protest, but compared to what people have been experiencing in Palestine at the hands of their colonizers, it's not extreme at all. This is what our ruling class has decided will be normal. When you have extreme levels of injustice taking place, it pushes people in a way that it pushes people toward a revolution and it pushes people to look for an alternative, sometimes very desperately. And the impact of Aaron Bushnell's act of sacrifice on millions of people was a powerful one because there are millions who understand that sentiment of what can we do? You know, we've been having march after march and protest after protest. Is the U.S. government backing off? No, actually, the latest now is that Biden is sending 50 warplanes, the largest uh, weapons shipment to Israel yet, you know, since October. That's after all of this marching and everything else, a generation is saying, okay, what's next? You know, and the RCA is here to say a revolution is what's next and preparing for that revolution concretely. You know, the, the, we see mass marches of thousands, tens of thousands saying intifada, intifada. That's exactly the way forward. Let's prepare the intifada concretely. What, is, what was an intifada if not a mass, uh, not just a, a mass spontaneous upsurge, it was mass working class organizing. It was workers talking to each other, coming together, making decisions, carrying them out. It was workers seizing control of society. We need to be preparing the communist cells in every American industry, in every workplace, every trade union, to bring a revolutionary program into the class struggle. That's the immediate task of the revolutionary communists of America. And I think we have arrived at a point where an entire generation understands that instinctively, they're saying, how do we do it? And that's what the RCA is here to answer. Mm -hmm. And I, polls show that for the first time now, earlier this month, a majority of Americans disapprove of Israeli military actions in Gaza. It's gone down from 50% approval rating, which is already pretty small, to 36%. Um, so that's pretty historic. And I think this is kind of like... Uh, a Vietnam War type moment where millions of people can see the evil and they want to act against it, even though there aren't even American troops being sent on the ground. So you can actually also see the basis for U.S. imperialism right now is very weak. They're walking on thin ice. That's right. Everyone can see the role that the American ruling class has played in this and Biden in particular. I mean, this has really demolished the whole logic of lesser evilism. Think back to 2020, when every single media outlet, every single platform, all the ruling institutions 
were hammering on the same note. And what was their message? This is the most important election of your lifetime. You have to stop Trump. You know, we can't have four more years of this. And, you know, Biden's going to bring back stability and we're going to return to normal. And four years later, that uh, lesser evil option turned out to be Genocide Joe. You know, I mean, that's really an experience that has also helped people to take this step towards communist politics because they're saying this whole charade of the greater evil, the lesser evil, the back and forth between the Republicans and Democrats, clearly this is leading nowhere. Clearly we need something that breaks out of this altogether. People understand that the the system is dominated by an enemy class. You know, lesser evilism has lasted a long time. That has been a powerful argument for generations. And people on the left have said, you know, I don't like this guy, but I, I hate the other guy even more. And now they're realizing they're the same force. They're the same class, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that's th- that argument is breaking down. And it's not so much just about looking how things, how bad things have gotten over the last 10 years, the last 20 years. It's also what's at stake for the future. What's going to happen in the next five years, the next 10 years? I mean, you, you mentioned climate change and every other metric uh, where life has gotten harder. Well, we're seeing the symptoms of a system that is historically exhausted. And, you know, first and foremost, we are Marxists. You know, being a communist isn't just hating capitalism and wanting to fight back. That's an important part of it. But we are Marxists and we are Bolsheviks. We're Leninists. And that means that we have a worldview that's consistent. And that's the thread of our uh, orientation. You know, we have an ideological bedrock, if you will. And that's Marxist theory. And that's very important because when we're talking about these mass shifts in consciousness and what's happening historically, we need to approach these questions in a deep way and not in a superficial, you know, impressionistic way. We need to look at it scientifically. And what we're saying is that capitalism was progressive in its day. It actually carried out a progressive, an objectively progressive mission, which was to develop the productive forces. It it created the material basis for abundance. It's thanks to a period of capitalism that we now have the ability to plan the economy and actually end inequality and end starvation and all of these other forms of deprivation that have become daily life. I mean, we can tackle the climate crisis now, but we need to understand this as uh, Marxists. And part of it is the changes in consciousness, the way that millions of people look at the system is key. We're not talking about a small minority, you know, contrary to what our right-wing opponents uh, try to portray us as. We're not about a conspiratory small group of actors that is going to take over the government. That's not our intention. What we're saying is the working class, the vast majority of the population is coming to the conclusion that this system offers them nothing. And they're preparing to ask a very important question, which is what other system could we have? The point is, if this decline of capitalism has already produced a communist generation and we're stumbling across them left and right, we're finding them everywhere, you can only imagine what the political climate will look like in the late 2020s and into the 2030s, because the forces that are radicalizing people are not going to slow down. They're going to intensify and accelerate. The good times are not coming back under capitalism. And so we can confidently say that if you see now millions of communists emerging in the population who you know have a stance that would have seemed extreme just a few years ago, just wait a few more years, see how this becomes the mainstream of the broad layers of the working class. I mean, revolutionary ideas are about to take the American political landscape by storm, and we are just the very beginnings of that process. And so the revolutionary communists of America is just the first step toward a mass communist party and a mass communist movement. And we need to take that step now because it's a historic window of opportunity to organize the vanguard of what's going to be that massive shift. But we can keep talking about it. I'd like to show you it in the words of our comrades who have been writing in, asking, how do we get organized? I want to take action. 
I am ready to take action and be part of the revolution. I've always felt something was wrong with capitalism. It's ruining my life and the lives of so many people. I've reached a point where I can no longer just talk about how much I hate it. I want to do something, and this seems like the right place to be. I believe the only path forward for humanity is a proletarian revolution. Capitalism is actively and indiscriminately destroying the planet. I have two small children, and thinking about the world that they will inherit makes me weep. I want to be part of the solution to the sickness that grips the world, as I recognize no one can save us except for ourselves. The world is burning, and the people burning it have names and addresses and more money than most third world countries can even dream of. I'm sick of sitting around and watching the world burn, and watching human beings struggle at the hands of some greedy capitalists. I want to educate myself, take action, and encourage others to do the same. I'm so pissed about the state of the world in our nation, and I want to do something productive with my rage, rather than just wallow in it. Thank you for what you're doing. You would not believe us if we told you how many messages like this we've received day after day saying, there is nothing else that I would rather do. I would give everything to building this party. That's the sentiment that's out there. And that's the task ahead of us, to organize that layer urgently. Today, comrades, we're going to draw out the logical conclusion. This country, the United States of America, the land of McCarthy, the land of the Red Scare, the belly of the beast of world imperialism, the so-called superpower of world capitalism, has produced tens of thousands of revolutionary communists who are ready to fight. We will step forward and build the party that we need. That's why the Central Committee has arrived at the unanimous decision to found a new party across the U.S. A genuine communist party of fighters in the spirit of Bolshevik Leninism. We will hold the founding Congress of the Revolutionary Communists of America at the end of this summer, a party for those tens of thousands who are already out there, who are waiting for this party to be founded, who are ready to step in. I mean, we are starting something that no living person has ever witnessed in the U.S., and that is the largest, most energetic, boldest communist recruitment campaign since World War II. And then once we reach that, I mean, with the first, if we gather the first 10,000 communists, our next task is to prepare an even broader layer, the largest recruitment campaign in American history. I mean, that's really right in front of us. It's not a far off prospect. It's something that is an immediate task. The comrades have been sharing every, it's an overwhelming experience, like two comrades standing outside of a Walmart in Minneapolis asking people, do you hate capitalism? And six out of 10 of them are saying, yes, I hate capitalism. And these are working class shoppers coming in and out of a Walmart, and more of them say they want a revolution than not. I mean, if that's happening at one Walmart in one city, well, it's not just happening there. I mean, we can tell you every corner of the country is reporting the same sentiment, the same reception to our message. And it's making us realize the only thing holding us back is the limits of our boldness. I mean, we need to be visible. We need to get out there. We need to connect with this. Here's a comrade in Chicago who was sitting, just reading in the train, and just like that, she's recruiting a new communist. It was so funny. I got on the train uh, out of school with this guy, and I, there was something about him. I think I am developing a communist radar of some sort, because I, I saw him before I got on. Uh, but, you know, I was just like, oh, whatever, and sat on the train, and I've been reading um, In Defense of Linen, which is phenomenal. I'm only like six or seven chapters in, but highly recommend uh, comrades pick it up. So I'm reading the book, and right before I'm about to get off on the stop before, I take my headphones out to put them away, and I feel this gentleman looking at me, and I look up, and he goes, um, is that a good book? And I went, oh, yeah, it's really good. And he said, well, I might have to pick up a copy. And um, I was like, if you're willing to talk to a stranger about Lenin on the train, then like I have to recruit you. 
he said, you know, I had a lot of misgivings about Lennon and um, something to that effect. I was getting so excited that like his exact words <laughs> were in and out, but something to the effect of he had a lot of misgivings about Lennon. And I said, me too. Um, I'm in the RCA. And before I joined this group, um, I had kind of, you know, just learned about him almost as a dictator or um, yeah, up there with Stalin. He was like, yeah, same. And just turns out we are we get off at the same train stop together. And um, I said, well, you know, I'm with the Revolutionary Communists of America. Here's what we're about. We're all about ending capitalism. I said, are you a communist? And he went, oh, yeah. And I said, great. Well, then it's great that we met and we exchanged numbers. I sent him our website and uh, he said, this is awesome. When can we meet up? And so we have scheduled a meeting time on Sunday to talk and, and hopefully get him involved with the organization. But I mean, to me, it just goes to show you like, People, they are out there and, and they're just waiting. And um, I never thought that like something as small as like reading a book on a train would be, you know, enough to find someone like that. But people are just like waiting. They're just waiting to get involved in something revolutionary. I'm really looking forward to talking to him more about it and getting him involved. He seemed really excited too. And, and then it just got me feeling like so hopeful, just put me in like the best mood of like, oh yes, we can win, you know, we can do this. Um, I'm gonna read my book on the train every day now. Well, I think comrades should continue to read on the train and show your communist newspaper, your communist books proudly. Wear your communist t-shirts because it can be that easy. Now, here's another anecdote from Philadelphia. Comrades were just sitting around at a, at a park. So, yeah, actually, it was me, Ethan, and comrade Brandon. Um, we all kind of just met impromptu to discuss in the park we really weren't planning on necessarily like going out there and like talking to people and like agitating or anything in that in that moment but we were we were just kind of sitting in the park already talking about communism and this guy kind of walks up to us who is like canvassing he's you know, he's got the clipboard and he, he's asking people you know are getting getting them registered to vote you know um you know asking them like are you registered in the state of pennsylvania you know it doesn't matter like what party you registered for etc cetera, etc cetera. And then he asked us, he said, are you guys registered to vote? And we all kind of like looked at each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we all kind of looked at each other. And we were like, how do we, what are we going to say? Like, we were a little hesitant mm -hmm. at first to even engage with him. But I think it was Brandon who said like, um, what did Brandon say? He said, we're communists. Yeah, Brandon yeah, was like, we're communists. Up. He's like, yeah, we're not really like interested in electoral politics. And the guy was like, oh, I know how that goes or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I said like, well, are you a communist? Like, are you interested in, in like socialism? And he was like, yeah, I mean, I'm something, he said something like, I'm something of a communist or like, I definitely like agree with the ideas. And so we started talking to him. Right? Yeah, that's how the conversation started. Um, and I think this really goes to show that, you know, communists really are everywhere. You know, I, I never would have thought that a canvasser walking up to us would be the type of person that we could potentially have a good conversation with or even potentially recruit. So we get into this great conversation with the guy, right? You know, um, we, we, we start feeling out where his politics are and we quickly learn that he has absolutely no illusions in the Democrats or the Republicans. You know, he he's very straight up. He's like, yeah, I'm just out here because uh, I need to pay the bills. I need to put food on my table. That's why I'm signing people up to vote. And we get into a good conversation. You know, uh, he, he's been feeling pretty pessimistic that he, he felt like he didn't really see a way out of all the things that he sees are wrong with the world, including the current two-party system. Um, and that's where we start talking to him. We start talking about Black Lives Matter. And, you know, we ask him straight up, like, imagine the potential that's an uprising of millions of Americans on the street across the country could have had if it had a genuine revolutionary working class leadership. And, you know, this this seemed to get through to him. This was the first time he actually came into contact with communists who were actually trying to organize, trying to do something about the world and not just complain online about it. Yeah, we actually sold him a paper. He bought the paper um, and we also helped him reach his quota. We registered to vote under, I think, the Revolutionary Communists of America <laughs> um, officially. So that was pretty cool. But and that's great. I think that was a protest uh, registration. <laughs> now, it's important to note, too, that we're trying to find and recruit and organize all of those who are already communists, but it's not just those people that we can reach right now. There's millions more who might not know what communism is, might think 
that they hate communism because of, you know, all the red scare propaganda. But when we talk to them, they like what we have to say. They like the communist program. That's why uh, we need to be, you know, organized in branches, reading, analyzing the news, uh, studying theory, because communism is not just an identity. It's not just about wearing the hammer and sickle and shouting communism. It's actually about bringing answers to the burning problems, the burning questions that people have. And that's what our comrades in Columbia, Missouri did when they encountered someone who they did not expect necessarily to be interested in communism. We were out tabling, recruitment tabling outside uh, the local Columbia farmer's market, simply asking with a standard slogan to pastors by, are you a communist? And if they said yes, obviously, uh, worked on getting them organized right on the spot. And typically, with as, through our experience, we've, we've noticed that the youth are the type that tend to be attracted to this slogan. And sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll ask older, older people passing by if they're a communist. Usually you get bewildered looks, uh, often snide or hostile responses, especially with the boomer population. And so, you know, sometimes I'll ask people this, sometimes they won't. Nolan, with real communist boldness, decided he's just going to ask everyone. Well, I mean, obviously there's going to be, you know, a few guys who are just mad, like, why would you ever bring communism into the country? But it's pretty easy to shrug those people off. I would just, I would just ask people, hey, good morning, good afternoon, hello, are you a communist? And I think he said specifically, uh, hi, sir, are you a communist? And this man turns around and, like, exclaims, kind of, like, touches himself, bewildered, that someone would ask that a man wearing like an old army jacket, big bold letters, army across the front. And as he gets closer, I see he's got a little cross pin with a flag in the lapel. And my first read is this guy has got to be a Trump supporter. He did not have a hat though. Uh, he did have a, a classic uh, boomer mustache. He looked like he was in his sixties or seventies. Would the stereotype of what you would expect the Trumper to be. Yeah, I wasn't afraid to like ask anybody that I encountered if they were communists. And, you know, just routine, I asked this guy, which led to this interaction. He stopped me and he, I think he said, do I look like a Trump supporter? <laughs> and then I think I just got a little bit flabbergasted. I, I didn't really know how to respond. But eventually he just starts uh, talking more. I, I believe he asked about our cause. And then that's when I invited Sam over to speak. We, we started talking about the paper, the latest mm -hmm. issue of, of Socialist Revolution at the time. has a big picture of Joe Biden's face and says in bold letters, down with genocide Joe. And I think he introduced himself as Randy. He asked us if that meant we supported Trump. And of course, we clarified, no, of course we don't support Trump. We want to overthrow the whole rotten system, Biden and Trump included. And that seemed to get some sympathy from him, had some back and forth. And he, at the time, decided, oh, I'm just going to keep going into the farmer's market. Probably 20 or 30 minutes later, he comes back out the same way and sees us. And he wanted to talk more. Uh, and he immediately said, as a veteran, he wasn't in favor of violence whatsoever. He was very much a pacifist and uh, did not like armed um, conflict in general. But the first thing that came to his mind when he started talking about Joe Biden was genocide Joe, was what is happening in Gaza with the funding and direct support of American imperialism. And what he tells us is, you know, he says he's no fan of violence, but he would love to see Netanyahu strung up by his feet for what he's doing in Gaza. He seemed to like our ideas, and he ended up donating the cost of the paper and probably left with a, a good impression. You could never guess from looking at this man that he would how be even like interested in a conversation with somebody donning you know communist colors and communist ideas. First of all, the fact that he turned around, that was surprising enough, but then be he engaged in conversation, that was also surprising. But then it was a friendly conversation. That, that was what surprised me the most, that... I, I would not assume that of him, but even if he were to pass it off, just the idea of like, wow, these are these bold, young communists asking this question, spreading the word. That's intriguing. I think that's one of the big strengths of Audacity, and that's something we should continue to practice. By the way, earlier this year, we did not have a branch in Colombia. And just like that, one comrade moved there and he started a branch. And now we have eight comrades organized, going strong and growing. So if you're listening to this and you're wondering if we already have branches in the city where you're from, first of all, chances are yes. 
But even if we didn't, then we can give you the tools that you need to get started, to start your first communist cell, to organize in your workplace, your neighborhood. We want to plant the flag. We want to show that the communists are here and we're organizing and you need to be organizing as well if you're a communist. Every day there are moments when people are suffering, people are pissed off and no lead is given. There's not really a, an answer given in the moment. And we need to be communist 24-7 every day, be ready to connect with that mood and do something about it. And so the revolutionary communists of America are doing just that, agitating and organizing at our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, on trains. And here's a great example from a comrade in Philadelphia. I was coming back home from a demonstration organized by Drexel Resident Assistants. And I was going to take the train. It was 5 p.m. on a Thursday evening. A lot of workers also trying to get home after their eight-hour long shifts. And, you know, as I waited for the train, which took like 40 minutes, a train finally started to arrive. But it never stopped. And then another one, and another one, and a fourth one. And, you know, after 40 minutes on the platform, there were like a hundred people at least, like a crowd at that point. And I was kind of idling, listening to a podcast. And it clicked to me that, you know, people are probably pissed because all they want right now is just to get home and probably take a nap after being exploited for the whole day. So I saw the opportunity of being, you know, the communist at this, at this particular moment. So I took it. And I luckily had all the leaflets with me from the demonstration. So yeah, I seized the opportunity and I started walking across the platform with no cuts to SEPTA leaflet in my hand. I had 30 copies and I was screaming, hey, who is tired of shitty public service? They're cutting off $200 million from SEPTA's budget. And I was asking, you know, who wants to change this as workers collectively? We have the ideas necessary. And you know, I had a few conversations as well, and I was exclaim exclaiming that, you know, no budget improvement or any genuine reform will come from above just because. It will have to be, you know, working class struggling together for those reforms, demonstrating, striking. This is the only way reforms have ever been won, and this is the only way we can win those reforms. And, you know, during those conversations, I tried to point out that ultimately it's the capitalist system that leads to the shitty system, and we need not just to struggle for better living conditions, not for not just for better public service, but also, you know, for the end of capitalism and the end of the day, because this is the root cause of all these evils. And the reaction was profound. People, you know, came to me asking for the leaflet, grabbing it out of my hand. And all of my leaflets were reading pretty much gone immediately. So I just continued to stroll around handing out other leaflets about Palestine, about the arena that are trying to build in Chinatown right now and destroying the neighborhood in the process. So you can see our comrades skillfully starts to agitate about why the anger they're feeling right now is a problem of capitalism and how communists have a solution to that immediate problem, but also connecting that to the need for mass working class action and to ultimately get rid of capitalism altogether. And he keeps going. And eventually the train finally came. So I got onto the train and of course it was packed. <laughs> so inside the train, I continued to agitate. You know, despite multiple people being pressed against me in the packed wagon, I continued to say like, hey, who is enjoying themselves right now? Who is having fun right now? Who thinks this is normal? Who thinks this should continue happening? Who wants to fight this? You know, who wants to organize as workers to fight this horrible system? And I also connected, you know, the fact that they're cutting off 200 million from SEPTA's budget to the fact that they're sending billions of our taxpayer dollars to Israel to commit the genocide that it's committing right now. And this really, you know, vibrated in the room. People were looking at me, people were, were nodding. And I started handing out leaflets and, you know, I was pretty much packed in, in the train. So I couldn't see much besides, you know, the faces immediately surrounding me. but between those people, hands started popping out and waiting for a leaflet. <laughs> so all of my leaflets were gone immediately again, the rest of them on all other kinds of topics. And I saw, you know, someone who started reading the leaflet, 
the leaflet that was in their hand got snatched. So, yeah, I had conversations with the people immediately surrounding me. Some of them didn't know what communism is, but, you know, as I explained it more, they were completely on the same point with me. They were they agreed that we need to organize together as workers. They agreed that, you know, this system is not reformable. We need a revolution. And this just goes to show, you know, the mood in society, the great potential for us to find class fighters and organize them right now for giant upheavals and unrest, protests, strikes. This is already starting to happen and it's only going to increase in quantity and quality. To heed this comrade's advice, our comrades in Dallas took the initiative. They noticed that they, we didn't yet have a presence at the University of Dallas. And so they just went ahead and sent a few comrades in to start a communist cell. And they got an overwhelmingly positive response. My name is Ben. I'm our area press officer for DFW. My name is Mary. Um, I'm the DFW3 secretary. It was our first time um, on the UTD campus. I knew that like the people, like the, you know, we as the communists, we're here. Uh, we're there, that there are other communists at UTD, like no doubt there are. Um, and we gave a number of agitational speeches and we, we ultimately like, we turned a lot of heads. We had really good discussions um, afterwards. When this university truck pulled up, we were like, well, that's it, man. Wow, this was really short lived on Dallas. Like it's over already. Um, and he gets out and he has the huge, like the biggest smile on his face. And we, he, he's, he, he comes to us and he says, finally you're here. And we're like, well, oh, hang on. Um, he bought, I think just under $30 worth of books and papers. Um, and now he's, he's a member in our, in our first branch in Dallas. Uh, yeah, he's, he's really excited to, to be a part of our party. He's going to be the press officer for that branch. So that's exciting. There was an older gentleman that like had ran up to the table. Like he, he, I guess like caught it in the corner of his eye, turned and like whipped his head and like ran straight to the table. Um, you know, he signed up. You can tell like looking at the, the contact sheet, like looking at how he wrote, it's like he was just in a rush. And it's like he left a comment that just said, finally, like just finally. And I think that's sort of the clear message that, that this first day uh, brought to us is it's, you know, finally that you were on campus and we couldn't agree more. For press sales that day, it totaled to just over $60 at $61. And then for contacts, uh, we got 22 contacts that day with another two following an Instagram post that we made. So we went from nothing at that university to now we have a communist cell. And by the way, the comrades were not just tabling and talking to people like that. They were agitating. Comrade Mary, who was just talking earlier, she stood up on a chair at the university cafeteria. And off the cuff, she just delivered this inspiring speech. May I have your attention? My name is Mary, and I'm a revolutionary communist. Are you tired of inequality? Oppression and exploitation? Are you tired of seeing our government spit in our faces with presidential candidates that do not represent us, that do not represent the working class? We can no longer sit around and let them control our society, a society that we, the working class, have built. We can no longer sit around and watch the crisis of the Palestinian genocide, of poverty, of homelessness, racism, sexism, and of capitalism. The list goes on and on. We need to organize on a class basis immediately. We need to organize. And this is something that we're doing around the country. Our comrades are agitating at street corners uh, and trains, at Palestine protests. We've been organizing. We've had a, a, a massive presence in every single branch. Uh, we've participated in hundreds and hundreds of demonstrations to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people against the genocidal war that's been carried out with U.S. imperialist backing. And actually, to help with these efforts, we, we launched a new communist newspaper, the, the print voice of the Revolutionary Communists of America. We're going to talk about this more next week. There's no doubt about one thing. The RCA is a Bolshevik party. Bolshevism also recognizes the importance of the press as a revolutionary instrument. Even though we live in the digital age, we're here in the 21st century, we're talking to you through a podcast, that doesn't mean that we do not need something physical that we can take with us into the streets, onto subway cars, into our workplaces, 
and used to show people. I mean, when you get the, the first copy of The Communist, I hope it's very clear. A lot of what we've just described in this episode, why we're launching the Revolutionary Communists of America, the 50-year decline of capitalism that has given rise to this generation, what it means to launch a Leninist party, all of these things basically form the theme of the first issue of the paper. But it's also going to give you a sense of this political vacuum that we're talking about, the reception that we're getting in so many cities, all these little anecdotes. You're going to see that the time is ripe. This country is ready for a Bolshevik force to be spread like wildfire. And we're taking the first steps to doing that. And you're going to see in this paper a live bulletin of our progress. Yeah, and you can go to communistusa.org slash donate to get a copy of the paper, become a monthly uh, subscriber. It's going to be a monthly paper, so you'll get a copy every month shipped to your door. But even better, I mean, if you want to support the paper, that means you want to support the party, you should join the party. And uh, this Saturday, April 6th, we're going to be organizing launch parties, rallies, marches, agitation, recruitment booths all over the country to launch the paper. So if you want to participate in that, if you want to pick up a copy locally, just reach out to us uh, via social media. You can write our email and we'll make sure to put you in touch with the comrades so you can actually be a part of those activities this Saturday. And next week, we're going to report on the progress uh, from those activities and we'll talk a little bit more about the role of the revolutionary press for a Leninist party.